Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be reading from John chapter 20 and I'll be reading verses 19 through 23. And this is what it says. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Pray with me. Jesus, breathe on us gathered here this day that we might know the strength and the comfort of your spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Years ago, there was a woman in my church that uh, every time that I saw her, that there was a minute other than just hello, she would tell me the same story. And I didn't mind because I would like the story, and she obviously liked the story a lot. Every time she told it, she said it with a little grin on her face. She was in her 90s and, and when she was telling the story, but the story was about a time when she went to the hospital when she was in her 80s. She had to have surgery, and when she got out of surgery, she was in the recovery room. She said she opened her eyes, and standing over her real close was the, pres was the Presbyterian minister. And she said, oh, hi. And the Presbyterian minister said, oh, I thought you were dead. Did you smell smoke and ashes? <laughs> <laughs> well, she would, she would just, she, she would tell that story every single time with a little grin on her face, and she wouldn't go into the detail of it. I don't know if, if this was, you know, his method of evangelism to start talking about heaven and hell or what it was, but she, she always, we all have stories that we love to tell, and we all have stories that we love to hear. The story this morning is the Easter story, and all over the world, people are listening to this story. People are telling this story. For over 2,000 years, people have been telling this story, repeating this story. And, and, and just this day, millions of times all over the globe, this story will be told. The Easter story. It's a story that we love to hear. It's why we come together to hear the story, 
to remember the story. It's a story that was told by, by all the New Testament writers. This, this story of Jesus. And there may be some details that are different from one to another. But there's certain points of this story that all of them are incredibly consistent. That God sent his son, Jesus, to let folks know what God is like. That God is a good God and a loving God. And we see it again and again through Jesus' actions, that he came to heal and to restore, to give sight to the blind, to make whole those who are broken. He came to, to forgive. And when he'd given God's best to the people, strange thing happened. You would think they would all surround him and say, how wonderful is this, stay with us forever. But no, that's not what happened. What happened was people joined together and they began to conspire, conspire that he be put to death. It was envy, it was hatred, it was sin that conspired against him. And they used an inside man. Well, it didn't catch Jesus off guard that on the last night of his life, he called his, his insiders, those that were closest to him, his 12 disciples, he called them to an upper room and he told them what was going to happen the next day. He told them that one of them would betray him and that one of them would deny him and that they would all flee. Well, they all said that wasn't going to happen. There was no way that was going to happen. But that's exactly what happened. But Jesus chose to love them anyway. And what he did in showing them kind of death that he would die he gave them bread and a cup, representing his body and his blood, his love for them, given for them. And then a few hours later, there in the garden, it was Judas who led this strange mix of, of temple guards and Roman soldiers right up to Jesus. And he betrayed him with a kiss. Now, they didn't take Jesus off kicking and screaming. No, far from it. When Jesus said, whom do you seek? They all fell to the ground. That Jesus didn't, didn't give up his life because it was taken from him. That Jesus gave his life freely. He had power enough for them all to fall to the ground with a word. But instead, he let them carry him away. He went through a, a mock trial. They beat him. They spit on him. They, they tore his clothes off of him. They put up a crown of thorns on his head and made him carry his, his cross up a hill called Golgotha. And when they got to the top of the hill, they nailed his hands and feet into the cross. And after hanging on the cross, slowly dying the most excruciating death that's imaginable, you would think that he'd call out in curses like any other man who, who says, well, if you don't love me, I don't love you. But that's not what he said at all. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And when he breathed his last tells us that the, the veil of the temple was, was torn in two. Now, the, the, the temple had a holy of holies and there was a veil that, that where the, the Spirit of God, the, the glory of God was housed in the temple. It tells us that at that point that it was torn from top to bottom, that the Spirit of God was, was poured out. The second thing that you ask the disciples, they, they differ on some details, but the second thing that they're all incredibly consistent on is that Jesus 
died. They didn't say, well, you know, he's like the spring. He's going to come back any day. He's going to bloom even prettier than before. Nope. They didn't say, you know, that whole thing about it, Jesus is going to be like a caterpillar. He's going to come in one way. He's going to be transformed something else. Nope. Dead was the word. And when the Romans killed people, they were good at it. And when the Romans killed you, you stayed dead. And so they buried him. They buried him in a grave. Well, they had to do it hurriedly because the Sabbath day was coming. And the Sabbath day started in dusk of the evening. And they did what they could do to prepare his body until the dusk came. And then they buried him. And it was on the third day that Mary Magdalene came to continue the preparation of his body. She was waiting for the light to come. But while it was still dark, on the first day of the week, she entered into the garden. And she saw that the the stone was rolled away, the place that he had been buried, that the stone had been rolled away. So she ran to tell Peter and the other disciples. Well, the Bible tells us that, that Peter and John ran immediately to the tomb. Now, John was younger, so he got there first, but he stopped outside, and Peter ran straight past him on into the tomb, and that's when John followed. They saw that the burial clothes were there, but rather than being strewn around like a grave robber had just taken out the body, they were rolled up neatly. And the Bible tells us that they saw and believed. Now, we're not real sure what they saw and believed. We know that they saw an empty grave, but we don't know what they believed because they immediately went home and locked themselves in the house out of fear. It was Mary who stayed there. And while Mary stayed there at the grave, she looked in one more time, and that's when she saw two angels, one sitting at the head and one at the feet. And they said, woman, why are you weeping? And then she turned, and it was Jesus. She didn't recognize that it was Jesus, and he said, whom do you seek? She thought he was the gardener, so she, she said, if you know where they've laid, me, laid him, tell me, and I will take his body. That's when Jesus called her by name. He called her Mary. And that's when her eyes were open, when Jesus called her by name. And she, she fell at his feet. She clung to his feet, and he said, stop clinging to me. I have not yet ascended to my father and your father. I have not yet ascended to my God and your God. Go tell the disciples. Go tell the disciples. And that's exactly what she did, that she had seen the risen Christ. Well, it wasn't just Mary. It wasn't just the disciples. The Bible tells over 500 disciples saw him at one time. But she went to tell the disciples that Jesus was ascended to the Father. Now, this is the message that we came to hear. This is the message that it's a message of hope. A hope for tomorrow. A hope for the future. That Jesus has, a, has prepared a place. A place that's no longer far off and, and scary. It's Father's house for you and for me. And for those who've had loved ones, that we've, someone that we, we love that we've lost to death, it's comforting. It's very comforting to us. Hope for tomorrow. Christine Federa, Louisville, Kentucky, while back wrote to Reader's Digest a story about her husband being asked to help rewire confessional at their church. Well, to get to the confessional, he had to crawl up in the attic of the, the church and, and balance along the, a, a beam in the attic in the sanctuary in order to, 
to make sure that the, the wiring was correct going down to the confessional. Well, Christine was fearful for her husband being up there in the, in the ceiling, so she stayed down in the sanctuary keeping an eye out and making sure that he was okay. Well, there were some members of the church gathered in the hall, and they left Christine alone and stayed quiet. They shot, thought that she was there praying alone. It wasn't until she shouted out, Sam, Sam, are you up there and are you okay? They became a little unnerved, but they became totally unhinged when he shouted back, Yes, I made it up here and I'm just fine. <laughs> well, that's the word that we, we all take comfort in. That Jesus has gone before us. And he's prepared a place for you and for me. He's prepared a place for our loved ones. C.S. Lewis said it wasn't until the death of his dear friend Charles Williams that he wrote something that he never thought he would write. He said that up until this point, he just saw it as sentimental claptrap. But then he said, since Charles William has died, heaven is no longer a strange, far-off place. That Jesus, Jesus has made it home. A home for those did we love a home for you and for me? It's hope. It's hope. It's hope for tomorrow. But know that the story doesn't stop right there. Mary Magdalene did go to Peter and to the disciples. He did tell, she did tell them that, that Jesus had ascended to the Father. And it was there, behind the, the locked, closed doors where Peter and the other disciples were, that Jesus appeared. It's what we read this morning. And what he said is, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. He showed them where the, the nails had pierced his hands and the, the spear had pierced his side. And that's when he said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now these are the same words of Genesis chapter 2. When God breathed into Adam's the, Adam the breath of life and he became a living being. That it's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that's breathed on disciples then and disciples now. Not just for hope for tomorrow, but strength. Strength for today in the here and the now. William Fry was bishop in Colorado. He told a story from his early days that he had volunteered as a reader to help a university student who was blind. And in reading for this university student, he got to know him well. And he asked him, had he always been blind? The university student's name was John, and John said, no, it wasn't until he was 13 that there was a chemical explosion, and he was blinded in the chemical explosion. And then John went on to say that it was there when he was 13 and he went blind that he became angry, and for six months he didn't leave his room. Then he began to, to pour over and rehearse his, his anger at 13 years old, becoming blind, and what could he do? He took all of his meals in his room for six months, and that's when one day his father came in, and he said, John, he said, winter's coming, and you need to put the storm windows on the house. That's your job. And I expect them to be on the windows when I return home this evening. He left the room and shut the door behind him. 
John said that's when he began to just stew inside and get even more angry. He said he got so angry that he decided he would show them that he would do it. He, he made his way down to the garage. He found the garage. He found the ladder. He found the tools. And the whole time muttering to himself, I'll show them. I'll get up on the ladder. And when I fall off that ladder and break my neck, then they'll have a son that's not only blind but paralyzed too. All day long, he worked at it until he did put the storm windows on the house. And that's when later he, he wrote, he said, I found out later that never at any moment was my father more than four or five feet away from my side. That's the story of Easter, the risen Christ, that he's, he's not only far off up in heaven to give us strength or hope for tomorrow that he's here as close as our very own breath, not four or five feet away, but as close as our very own breath to give us strength for today, strength that we don't have. It doesn't mean that suffering's not real. It doesn't mean that heartache's not real. He showed them his hands. He showed them his side. Suffering is real. Death and dying are real. But Jesus fought suffering. He fought sin. He fought death. He fought dying. He nailed it to the cross. And when he defeated it, he rose from the grave and gave that life of strength and power of his Holy Spirit to, to you and to me. Strength for today. This morning, I don't know where you are and I don't know what you've been through. It may be that you have been through that hard time and you've lost a loved one. Hear, hear that message of Easter, the hope for tomorrow, that Jesus has prepared a place for your loved one and Jesus has prepared a place for you. But don't let the story stop there that Jesus rose from the grave to breathe his life, the power of an overcomer, to live inside of you and me, that we might have strength for today. It's available to you now. That when you get up every morning, you begin it with a conversation, a listening a relationship where all day long and every minute of every day you speak, you listen, and you seek to do his will. Step by step, over time, he begins to, to transform, to change our will into being his will rather than that our wants become his wants. It's a power we don't have on our own, no matter how hard we've tried. And this morning, I'd like to pray with you. Let's pray. Jesus, we always need your strength. Not sometimes, but always. And it may be in that loss of a loved one that there's comfort, that you've prepared a place. And Easter, Easter points to that place that is hope for tomorrow. It also may be that we need strength for today. That there's something in this life. It may be fear and that's robbing peace. Well, peace was the first word that you said to those early disciples. And it may be peace is that first word that, that we need to hear this day. It may be an addiction. It may be just getting through the day requires a strength we don't have. That life is difficult and we need your strength. Or it may be that right now, this is the best time ever in our lives. It doesn't mean we need you any less. Your desire is a relationship where you live your life through us. Breathe on us and grant that, that relationship begin and continue this day. 
Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear. Serve with commitment, and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.